it is not the same as a human. It can do things that are pretty human-like, but it's still not human. And that's really important because humans make really life-important uh, critical judgments, and we need to make sure humans are still doing that. Today, we're diving into a topic that may change the landscape of education. This is the rise of AI and its implications for how we teach and what students should learn. So artificial intelligence isn't all that futuristic anymore. It's uh, happening right now, and it's happening quickly. So how do we use AI responsibly in schools? How do we prepare students to navigate a world where AI is going to play such a central role? Absolutely, Dan. Things are really moving fast. It's a, it's a little scary, right? There's a lot of potential for AI in education, but it's also a little bit uh, freaking me out, right? There's a lot of misconceptions about AI, um, so I'm really glad we have an expert here. Let's get into our episode. Welcome to Schools In, your go-to podcast for cutting-edge insights and learning. Each episode, we dive into the latest trends, innovations, and challenges facing learners. I'm Denise Pope, Senior Lecturer at Stanford GSC and co-founder of Challenge Success. And I'm here with my co-host, Dan Schwartz, Dean of Stanford Graduate School of Education and the Faculty Director of the Stanford Accelerator for Learning. Hi, Dan. Oh, Denise, all AI, all the time, Pope. Oh, man. It's scary. It, I, that, that scares me that you actually called me that and i know i'm dabbling in ai and it's actually a joke in my family because i am so like one of the least techie people you will ever know and for me to say actually i've been doing some work with ai my kids just like fall to the ground laughing so oh really they don't they don't they're not impressed with how advanced you are well they just don't even believe that i know what i'm talking about so i do I, but because the show today is going to be featuring someone who knows a lot about AI. And because I know this is more your world, I have a question for you. I have a okay. question for you, Dan. Okay. So AI keeps getting better and better. It keeps getting to do more and more things. And so my question to you is, and this is, I'm serious, don't mock me. Do you think there's going to be a time where AI will fully replace a human being? Uh, maybe I, I have two answers. One okay. is uh, glib and one is more serious. Okay. So, so I've thought about this. Like, uh, could AI fully replace me? Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so suddenly what that means is that there would be another Dan Schwartz. And like suddenly I meet myself and we duke it out for which Dan Schwartz gets to actually <laughs> be in the world. Uh, no, I don't think it's going to replace me. No. Uh, I, no. No, I think I think it's it's going to be more augmentation. Uh, so I, this is this is my favorite story about this, where people use the AI to surpass themselves, what they could do on their own, and I think that's a, a likely model for it, or it's a model I'd like to see. And the example is last year I I happened to be at several retirement parties, and the person who organized the retirement party would read a poem. They, and this happened in three separate parties. The organizer read this poem and they would say, you know, chat GPT wrote this poem with me. And they were so proud. They were so proud of their poem. I think the person who was retiring was thinking, uh, you couldn't buy me a Hallmark card. You couldn't even go to that much trouble. You just had the computer write a poem. But the person who wrote the poem was incredibly proud. And, that, and that's sort of when I got the clue that they, they don't see this as cheating. They don't see this as replacing. They see this as augmenting. It enables them to do things they couldn't couldn't do before. And so I think that's the kind of vision I like for AI and education. Yeah, I think, I mean, it makes sense. I, I know there's a famous line around AI that um, there's, uh, AI is used a lot in radiology. And there's a line that, you know, soon AI is going to replace the radiologist. And what a lot of people say now is no, radiologists who use AI to augment what they do, exactly what you said, to surpass or augment what they do, are going to replace radiologists who don't use AI. So that's kind of the line that keeps me sort of sane. Like, okay, we still need yeah. people, right? No, we still need the, people? <laughs> the, the AI is going to replace things that can be automated. You know, okay. like little, little ta it's very good at little tasks. You know, it'll be very good at that. Um, but I, I do think it's an interesting question about uh, what, what a future world with AI looks like. 
particularly with respect to education. And so we, we are very lucky to have with us uh, Professor Victor Lee, our very own professor at the Graduate School of Education here at Stanford. Uh, Victor sort of does everything. He, he looks at people learning and learning how to think about data, uh, STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, throughout K-12. Uh, he's also the leader of the Generative AI and Education Initiative at the Stanford Accelerator for Learning. And so he, he's done things to support AI. So he's going to answer all our questions, Denise. Okay, I'm totally excited. <laughs> so, so thank you, Victor. So just, just to give everybody uh, who's a Luddite like me uh, some set, uh, AI has been around for quite a long time. I remember way back, I wrote a program to play checkers, a three-dimensional checkers in AI. And I, I would take a move and then the computer would spend about a day and a half and then it would make its move. Uh, well, things, <laughs> things have changed. Uh, so explain sort of what generative AI is or, or chat GPT, which people probably know the name of by now. Well, sure. I mean, you talked about checkers and, you know, up until the last decade, we've been hearing about, oh, AI is the kind of thing that might win a game of Go or might win a game of chess. Um, but since 2022, it was uh, pretty impressive that we started to see AI that could produce new content. Um, and that's something that we just didn't expect AI to be able to do. And that's the kind that we call the generative AI. And that's what chat GPT does. I mean, chat GPT is sort of like a conversational partner, a chat bot, and you can ask it to write poems for a friend's retirement or to write instructions to play chess or a recipe for you. And um, those did not necessarily exist in the forms that uh, ChatGPT writes them. And that's been quite impressive, but it's not just text. It's also going on to video, sound, music, images. Um, so we're just seeing this whole new world in terms of what we thought of as being really amazing uh, bots or uh, game playing devices now can actually be partners in creating content. So uh, do either you or Denise have a sense of how big the computational resources are for like ChatGPT? Like, does it require all the electricity of Hoover Dam to run ChatGPT? Um, it takes a lot of energy to train these things. So like all um, of the AI that people are buzzing about right now uses machine learning. And it takes all of this data that we've been producing on the internet over decades um, and uh, feeds that in to sort of calibrate what to say or what, what all are the uh, right examples to give. And it's a huge amount. So to actually have computers go through that, um, takes a huge set of server farms and processors, generates a lot of heat, actually. It's one of the things that we don't talk about as much is the um, the, the carbon impact and the uh, global emissions that are coming out of all of the energy used to train these new AIs. Do you think that, I mean, obviously that's got to get, get better. So, someone's got to solve that problem because the climate change issue is real. So are, I'm, I'm assuming right now, this is a problem, but just like with everything, they're going to get better and they're going to figure this out. So this this is a little a little too academic, but uh, so a lot a lot of faculty who are doing AI need to go to the big companies because they've they've invested the billions of dollars to make these these models these large language models, and so people are worried what's left for the university. And what I've been told is uh, it's the university that's going to figure out sort of how to, how to break through the energy problem, you know, the computational barriers so that these things don't become so big and expensive that you can't, you can't actually use them. Yeah. Can I say one more thing that I think would help our, our listeners? Because I did not know this. Um, Chat GPT is like Kleenex in that you, Kleenex, I mean, Kleenex is a brand of tissue that you use to blow your nose, but everybody now calls all of those tissues Kleenex, even though there's different names for them. So let me just make sure I'm getting this right. Victor, definitely correct me. There are other names for generative AI and AI that uses large language models besides ChatGPT. So I don't want people to be confused. And we're just kind of, people talk about ChatGPT as if it's all the same 
Um, there's Bard. I don't even know has Bard been discontinued. Whatever Microsoft just came out with has a different name. So I don't want people to be confused by all the different names. Uh, they're all doing this sort of generative AI task that we're talking about. Is that right, Victor? Yeah, that Kleenex example is great, although it's really hard for me to not picture somebody blowing their nose um, into the AI. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's sort of the brand name. It's a big brand name. It's one of the most well-known, but it's not the only one. Um, we can blow our nose into many other products and, you know, we can use AI coming from many other different brands, including Google and, and you know, smaller companies that are still showing up on the market. Okay. I just wanted to clear the air. Okay. All right, Dan, so, I know you have a big question. Yeah, no, no. I, now, now that we've sort of given the backdrop, uh, I want to get to the meat of the, of the show. So, Victor, what should kids and teachers know about AI? Well, there's a lot of things that they're going to need to be thinking about. Uh, I mean, one is that it is not the same as a human. It can do things that are pretty human-like, but it's still not human. And that's really important because humans make really life-important uh, critical judgments. Um, and we need to make sure humans are still doing that. Um, it also means that it doesn't have sort of the same way of thinking about telling the truth or being accurate in the way that humans are sort of socially accountable for. So um, that's something else is that while it may sort of sound human or realistic, the information we don't know is reliable because it's sort of generating it on the fly and it doesn't have the capacity like we do to kind of check, was that right? Did I say something for real? And it, it makes stuff up. I mean, that's what they call the hallucinations in generative AI. I, I make stuff up. Uh, I was know, just going to say, it doesn't feel that different. I know people who <laughs> lie. Is, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But when you do it, you're doing it intentionally, um, hopefully for not bad reasons. Um, but, you know, this idea of intention that uh, the AI has, I mean, it's not the same way that a human operates. It's not thinking I'm looking to deceive you. It's looking at what is the right sounding thing to tell you, um, but no idea whether it's right or wrong. Um, one of the best ways to see it is you ask some of these tools to do math and they're terrible at math because they don't really understand you want it to do math. It wants you to say the right thing back, right sounding thing back when someone asks the math thing, which might be, oh, you want to hear numbers. So it'll tell you numbers, but it may not be the right numbers for the math thing that you're asking it. But I hear that it's getting better though, right? So like eventually it's going to be able to do math and not make mistakes. Yes or no? I mean, we should expect some improvements for sure. Um, but, you know, there's going to be ways in which while it gets better, we're going to be changing the kinds of things that we're doing. And so the demand is always going to be uh, changing. You know, the bar will continuously get moved. So we'll always count on it to get better. But we also, as humans, are going to be getting better too. And that's going to change what better is supposed to be. So how how do you teach this? Like, do I, I'm teaching an eight-year-old not to trust the computer, even though it sounds so trustworthy? I mean, how do you do this? Well, I mean, it's good to have conversations, um, you know, if it's with an eight-year-old or if it's in school, um, just to say a little bit about how this works, that, you know, this is a computer system, which is not human, is trained on information that it happens to have available, and people can kind of draw on their own um intuitions and experiences that not all the information is right. Uh, so it's not an expert on a lot of things. Uh, making that kind of known as an expectation is really good. And also teaching what are the kinds of things we want to do when we use AI. Like we want to cross check and verify with somebody who does know and look at real sources of expertise. Um, we want to be clear in terms of what parts AI has contributed to some of the work that we've been doing. So, Victor, you 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 have a project called Craft that's explicitly going into the into the high schools. Say, say a little bit about what you're trying to do and how. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you know we are all struggling with is everyone's got questions about AI. They want to know what kind of things this is going to do to our world, and that's going to appear in a lot of different ways. Whether you're going to be a scientist or work in business or work for a nonprofit. So with Craft, what we're doing is we're working with teachers from around the country to build out um, lessons and resources that they can use, whether they're an art teacher, English teacher, math teacher, science teacher in high school, um, and bring this as a topic to make as an open discussion in class to see a little bit about what's going on under the hood and how can we think about using this responsibly for all the different kinds of work or activities that 
we expect our young people to be doing as they grow up. And I know there's a pretty cool lesson on there about AI and bias or issues around um, bias with the technology. Can you just say a little bit about that? Because I think that's part of the hoopla that parents are nervous about and that teachers are nervous about as we're hearing like, well, could be promoting some unfair biases. For sure. Yeah. With uh, AI and any sort of new technology, it lets things happen faster. And for bias and bias to sort of be put out there um, faster and in larger amounts is kind of a scary thought. But, you know, the bias that we do see is because AI is trained on data and the data that we have um, can be really incomplete. So, you know, if the data are only trained on people who sound like Dan Schwartz and then adheres to Denise Pope speaking, it may not be able to understand what Denise Pope is saying just because it only is used to what Dan Schwartz can say. Well, think about that with all the images that are being used on the internet or the ways that people write or talk. And so those are some of the concerns. And because it can make things go fast and it can get around so quickly, um, it kind of rose, raises this risk of bias um, amplifying uh, at a rate that we just would not be comfortable with. Welcome back. This is Schools In with Denise Pope and Dan Schwartz, and we are talking with Victor Lee about all things artificial intelligence. So let me let me switch a little bit. Uh, so a student comes to you and says, uh, Professor Lee, I don't need to learn how to write anymore. The AI is going to do it for me. What what do you say back? What do you say back, Denise? You, you like hit them up on the side of their head and say English literature and writing's a beautiful thing. Or <laughs> you know me so well, Dan. Yeah. No, I'll say go talk to Victor Lee. Okay. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I want to hear. I want to hear Victor's response because I have. Yeah. First of all, I in my own courses, my grad students ask, "Can I use ChatGPT to help me write a paper to help me complete this assignment?" Nobody has ever come up to me and said, "You know, why do we need to write?" Uh, at that level. But I have had high schoolers in focus groups and middle schoolers in focus groups saying, if AI can do this, why do we need to learn it in school? And what's the purpose of school if AI can do all of these things? So I'm really interested to hear Victor's answer. Yeah, for one thing, I mean, that's sort of an all or nothing thinking. And really what's going to happen is AI is going to kind of lead to a bit of a reallocation or how much we emphasize some of these things. So here's a quick example. On my computer, I use a grammar editing tool, Grammarly, if you've had experience with it. And it you know, helps me with uh, when I use too much academic jargon or I have typos, which is quite often. And you know, the question there is, do I need to learn my grammar or do I need to learn how to spell because Grammarly is going to take care of it for me? And I'd say, yes, we don't want to have Grammarly having to be constantly changing everything and we have to be able to think through and make a judgment as to whether or not that recommended change is the right one. Now, does it mean that we need to spend all this time doing those grammar trees and, you know, figuring out um, all the nuances and drilling spelling and put, making it so high stakes? Probably not. Um, but it is important to be able to tell when you're using your, your, or your, or their, their, or their. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily matter um, that we now have tools that can help make these things move faster. It's not a bad thing to have the AI around there, but it is important we know and are able to make good judgment and let it do the thing that it's good at, which is fixing up some of our typographical errors and help us do the things we're good at, which is coming up with interesting and creative ideas and making persuasive points to other people. So, but I know that ChatGPT also comes up with could, what could be considered creative ideas, right? Dan, you, you could write a poem, right? That's how we started this out. So, so are you cool if your students are like using that for creativity? You know, it really can be. I mean, where does creativity come from? We want to think it's all just exactly one person's head. Um, so if you put somebody in a room with no nothing on the wall, no surfaces, um, we'd hope, oh, can they be creative and do something amazing? But even at, say, the Stanford Design School, they put people in these big, loud, colorful rooms with toys and objects and post-it notes and paper because actually having those things helps you to be more creative. It helps you to get out more ideas. So, you know, ChatGPT is going to be pretty similar. If I have a thought partner, if I have something that can offer something that's a little bit off the wall that I can improvise with, 
that could actually be a great creativity amplifier. So again, it's not an all or nothing. It's just going to sort of change the emphases. Um, and if we do this well, we're going to have it be that we even get better products or better outputs as a result. So I have a, then a question about equity because some people see this as like a great leveler right now. Everybody has the ability to write or sound like a writer or be creative. And other people are saying, no, this is just going to exas exacerbate things more because the haves, the people who have technology are going to be able to use it. And there's a bunch of people who don't. So what, what are your thoughts on people who are worried about the equity issue here? Well, I mean, you know, as a school of education, I think this is a really good conversation because schools are going to be one of the main ways that we make sure that there's access available to everybody. Um, and that's one of the important things that we want to keep in mind is that if we just flat out ban this, we're not preparing kids for the future world. And we also are not making it possible for kids who won't have easy access to this because maybe just family members aren't as familiar or they don't necessarily have the same technology available at home that they won't have the chance to learn it themselves. So I think that's one way to address those equity concerns. Um, and if we do think that this is going to be a big part of future life, future economy, then making sure that everyone has an equal starting point in terms of knowing what you can do with this and what its potential is and where its limits are probably be one of the most important ways that we could address equity. Can I, can I take a shot at this, Denise? Yeah, go for I, it. I, 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 like, I like Victor's response. Uh, I don't think it's just a question of access. Uh, it's also a question of what, what are people have access to. And so I think a lot of our curriculum is designed for the average, right? And, uh, and so kids with uh, special, you know, they have learning differences, or English is not their first language. Uh, you know, the hope is that these large language models uh, have captured enough of human experience. They can, they can actually personalize towards things that aren't just right down the middle average. And so that it could actually uh, access, but also access of quality that's tuned to the needs of particular learners, which has always been a, a challenge for us. So I, I think that's one, one possible help. You know, it's not just a question of access. It's also a question of what are they getting access to? Absolutely. So I, I, what, So, in our remaining minutes, I want you to put on your VR goggles and imagine the future. Uh, what, what is the classroom of the future going to look like? Kids just doing the same thing, but they have like a little personal assistant on their cell phone saying, no, dummy, don't do it that way. Do it this way. Like, what, what's it going to look like? I like to think it's going to look a bit more of Star Trek like um, where we're going to have some pretty cool technologies that can bring things really quickly into the classroom space um, in ways that we just have not been able to do in the past, whether it's, you know, a holographic simulation that interacts and talks back with you. If you want to sort of see a reenactment of some big historical moment, you could bring that quickly to a class and you don't have to rely on the field trip in the same way. Um, we may get ways that would um, pair up students in all different sorts of groups to help them really learn as much as they can from each other and learn to collaborate in interesting new ways and have really powerful tools that, you know, in the course of a school day, maybe they've already developed a whole new app just within morning to daytime uh, because these tools are so powerful. And in the course of that, learning a whole bunch of amazing new stuff about what that app addresses or how apps work or the questions that they have themselves as, in terms of their own personal interests. I will, so can I just say, I had a little glimpse of the future yesterday. This is true. In my class, one of my students brought the headset in and I don't even know what this does. He put it on, it's like that white, it's like white big goggles. He looked like a, like a human fly. And he's like <laughs> looking around the room and looking at, and none of my other students knew what was going on. I didn't know what was going on. And I thought, if, if this is the wave of the future, it's a little bit freaking me out. Like I can't make eye contact with this kid, right? So are we all gonna be in goggles so that we can make eye contacts? Are, are like, it was a weird experience. Let me just say that. What are your reactions? Uh, that is a weird experience. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I would go a different direction. Uh, so I, th I think uh, the amount of time that students spend creating, making, producing will increase a tremendous amount. Um, so I've always thought 
uh, computer science is kind of a privileged domain for teaching because students make things and then they get feedback. They get to see how it works, how people use it. I think the new technologies will make it possible to do that in every discipline so that kids, for example, could design uh, an ecosystem and see if it actually works based on the science. So I think, I think there could be a huge change in pedagogy uh, that allows students to basically own the means of production to help them create and produce. My big fear, of course, is that we'll just use AI to be really efficient at teaching in the ways we always have, which aren't perfect, right? But, but my vision of the classroom of the future is kids are doing a lot more projects because the AI can help manage the class. You know, project-based learning is great, but it's, it's tough on the teacher. Now the AI can keep track for them. Uh, kids can be creating things, simulations and so forth. It sounds think, like a Victor? lot more, a lot more professional development. That's what I think. No, no, it'll be like YouTube. It'll be like YouTube. Every teacher who's got a projector uses YouTube. It's that easy. Mm, no? I, okay, you're coming back. Victor's going to come back in like a year or two and report back because I think you're oversimplifying. I think or maybe I'll more... just send my AI to report back on my yes. behalf. And you'll be talking to the <laughs> fake Dan. You'll be talking to the AI Dan when you come back. Oh my goodness. Sort well, of surreal to imagine just what our AI doppelgangers are going to be having all the conversations and it's just our AI talking to other people's AI. And what are we doing? Probably sipping drinks at the beach. Yeah, that was the image I had. I agree with you, Victor. I think, no, uh, pe- that freaks me out, people. No. You're going to be skiing instead? Is that no, the, no, I'm just, like, did you not see that movie where everybody's a couch potato because all of their AI people are doing all their AI thing and we just sit back and become couch potatoes? Mm. Well, that's why we like those movies. They give us cautionary tales to sort of remind us that isn't the future that we want. Um, although I would enjoy some time on the couch and a nice drink every now and then. That is a good place to end. Thank you so much for being here, Victor. Thank all of you for listening to Schools In with Dan Schwartz and Denise Pope. And you can catch all of our episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you tune in. Uh, So Denise, let me put you in the hot seat. What's your big takeaway? Oh my gosh, there's so many takeaways. One thing that I am going to really remember and think more about is that AI can be used to spark and push us creatively as humans, but we really need to teach students how to critically evaluate the information that AI is providing. Just because something sounds like it's right doesn't mean it is always right. No, that's nice. I think that's well said. I personally like the creativity aspect. Uh, I don't think people should only view AI as scary or as replacing humans or cheating on tests for students. I think there's a lot of room for people to be very productive and creative with AI. Totally. And I think we have another thing that I don't want us to overlook, which is the equity issues here. Because as AI becomes more integrated into education, we need to really make sure that all students are benefiting from these tools. And that's not always the case. So, Victor. It's a lot to navigate, but I know there's a ton of potential. I can't wait to, to bring you back in a few years to see how it's evolved. Denise, months. Everything will have changed. You know, our AI robots are going to meet up and have a chat on this topic for us and let us know. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, well, we'll see. You never know. In any case, thank you again to Victor, and thank you all for joining us on this episode of Schools In. Remember to subscribe to our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you tune in. I'm Denise Pope. I'm Dan Schwartz. I am a synthetic AI robot who serves education for everyone.